On May 10, 1940, the Germans launched a relentless assault. Just two days later, a desperate gambit unfolded in the skies over Maastricht. Number 12 Squadron dispatched six ferry battle aircraft, woefully ill-equipped for the ferocious dance of daylight warfare. They were sent to shatter the German advance toward Brussels by bombing bridges over the Albert Canal. Lacking speed and defensive might, these airborne heroes etched their legacy with daring assaults on the bridges of Maastricht and Sedan. Divided into two desperate trios, the battles descended upon their targets, confronting a maelstrom of anti-aircraft fury. Amidst the thunderous cacophony, their metal wings clashed against an unseen foe. In the crucible of technological ambition, the British Air Ministry issued a challenge in April 1933, casting its gaze toward the future of aerial warfare. The venerable Hawker Hart Light Bomber, a stalwart of the Royal Air Force, was slated for replacement. The mandate was clear. Conceive a single-engine aircraft capable of transporting a thousand-pound bomb load, manned by a crew of two, across a thousand-mile range at a brisk 200 miles per hour. Undeterred by the technical hurdles posed by the audacious specification, Ferry, a pioneering aviation company, stepped into the fray. C.R. Ferry, the company's visionary leader, harbored reservations about the feasibility of the Air Ministry's demands. Yet Ferry presented a range of alternatives, blending pragmatism with ambition. Among the submissions, one design stood out, a manifestation that adhered closely to the Ministry's exacting criteria. Against the odds, the Air Ministry embraced Ferry's design. A contract was inked on June 11, 1934, charging Ferry with the construction of a prototype. Guided by the skilled hand of Marcel Lebel, the Ferry design team birthed an aircraft with a singular cockpit housing a crew of three, pilot, observer navigator, and wireless operator gunner. As the prototype took shape, the Air Ministry, brimming with anticipation, issued a production order for 155 aircraft in June 1935. The battle, though destined for obsolescence from its inception, found an unexpected ally in the geopolitical climate of the mid-1930s. The ominous rise of the Luftwaffe fueled a desire for numerical parity, leading the RAF to order 155 battles in 1935, well before the prototype's maiden flight. With the specter of war looming, expediency triumphed over preference and the battle, equipped mostly with the Merlin III engine, became a vital force. The ferry battle finally took to the skies on March 10, 1936, under the command of Flight Lieutenant Christopher Staniland. Its capabilities would eclipse its predecessors, the Hawker, Hart, and Hind bombers, as it could carry twice the payload over twice the distance. The ferry battle emerged as a curious chapter, a blend of modernity and obsolescence. Conceived with a low wing and stressed skin construction, its silhouette bore an uncanny resemblance to an oversized fighter aircraft. Armed with a payload capacity that included four 250-pound bombs in its bay and two beneath its wings, the battle embodied the spirit of offensive capability. Its crew of three, nestled in the elongated glasshouse cockpit, put their lives in the hands of this machine. Yet, as the battle soared into the skies, it found itself tethered to a bygone era. The specifications of P-2732, which once defined its prowess, had become relics of a past age. The prototype, while meeting the initial requirements, existed in the shadows of aircraft like the Vickers Wellington, born of 1933 specifications and boasting superior performance metrics. By 1939, the battle's age was apparent, yet it lingered on the front lines due to the absence of more modern alternatives. Taking flight on April 14, 1937, the battle's genesis saw the maiden production aircraft take wing, powered by the groundbreaking 1,030-horsepower Rolls-Royce Merlin I. This marked the engine's debut in RAF service, a propitious start for the renowned power plant. Number 63 Squadron was the first RAF squadron to embrace the ferry battle just a month later. As war clouds gathered on the horizon, it all found itself in the arsenal of eight training squadrons in number six group and ten frontline bomber squadrons in number one group, integral components of the advanced air striking force. The Battle Mark I boasted impressive specifications, a top speed of 257 miles per hour, a range of a thousand miles, 
and a service ceiling reaching 25,000 feet. Armed with a single forward-firing .303-inch machine gun, a rear Vickers K-gun, and a payload of 1,000-pound bombs, the battle was a force to be reckoned with. Yet, flaws were woven in the tapestry of innovation. The rear gunner's position suffered from a downdraft caused by its protective screen. This compromised rear visibility, a vulnerability that would soon be exposed. As the battle proliferated, a new chapter unfolded at a state-of-the-art factory in Stockport, later expanding to Birmingham's Austin Motors. By January 1939, the Royal Air Force could boast a fleet with over 400 ferry battles at their disposal. The stage was set for a potential aerial onslaught against the Ruhr as 10 ferry battle squadrons under the aegis of Number 1 Group relocated to France on September 2, 1939. The strategic move was part of a prearranged plan contingent upon German aggression in the West. However, the Germans, embroiled in the conflict in Poland, refrained from provoking the Western powers, plunging the front line into the so-called phony war. In the crucible of conflict, the battle undertook reconnaissance missions over the German front line. A watershed moment occurred on September 20th, 1939, as a ferry battle from No. 88 Squadron downed a Messerschmitt Bf 109, securing the battle's legacy with the first RAF kill of the war. Yet, even in triumph, shadows loomed. The vulnerability of the bombers in the face of German fighters became painfully evident, signaling the trials that lay ahead for the stalwart ferry battle. With the ominous specter of war looming, the German invasion of Poland in September 1939 thrust the ferry battle into the heart of conflict. Ten squadrons of these aircraft were dispatched to France as part of the Advanced Air Striking Force, setting the stage for a series of pivotal moments. The echoes of success resonated on September 27, 1939, when No. 103 Squadron achieved another triumph against the fearsome BF-109. However, the tides of fortune would soon take a grim turn. The fateful raid on September 30, 1939, marked a harrowing episode for No. 150 Squadron, as four out of five ferry battles were lost over enemy positions in the Tsar. Tragically, the remaining aircraft succumbed to crashes upon landing, painting a stark picture of the challenges faced by these aviators. The year 1940 ushered in a new chapter of desperation as the German invasion of France and the Low Countries unfurled. The ferry battle found itself thrust into ground attack sorties, a role for which it was ill-suited, lacking crucial features like self-sealing fuel tanks and an armored cockpit. The toll was staggering, with 77 out of 118 aircraft lost between May 10th and 15th, 1940. Amidst this maelstrom on May 12th, Flying Officer Donald Garland and Sergeant Thomas Gray etched their names in history as the first RAF recipients of the Victoria Cross in World War II. Their valor during an attack on the Feldwezelt Bridge in the Netherlands, though posthumously honored, reflected the indomitable spirit of those who faced insurmountable odds. The vulnerability of the ferry battle became painfully apparent during the early days of the German Blitzkrieg. Tasked with low-level attacks against the advancing German forces, the strategy aimed to evade enemy fighters but exposed the aircraft to a barrage of anti-aircraft and small arms fire. The cost, in lives and machines, was devastating. On May 10, 1940, the first day of the German assault, 32 battles embarked on a mission to attack advancing enemy troops, and 13 were lost. The following day, seven out of eight dispatch battles met a similar fate. The toll rose on May 12th, when a force of five battles targeted crucial bridges over the Albert Canal. None returned. By the 14th, Low-level attacks were abandoned due to unsustainable losses. New tactics briefly showed promise, but on May 14th, 63 battles faced interception by BF-109s during a mission against canal bridges, resulting in the loss of 35 aircraft. High casualties persisted as the RAF retreated in the wake of the German advance. The surviving squadrons were ultimately withdrawn to Britain on June 15th, 1940, having lost the majority of their aircraft and proving the battle's inadequacy against low-level operations and fighter opposition. As losses mounted, the remaining ferry battle squadrons conducted their final sortie on June 15th, marking the denouement of their frontline service. Between May 10th and June 20th, 1940, a staggering 137 ferry battles were lost, 
signifying the inevitable decline of this once prominent aircraft. Upon their return to Britain, the number one group reformed, still equipped with the battle. However, daylight raids were abandoned, and the majority of battle squadrons transitioned to nighttime attacks on German invasion barges in French and Dutch ports. In the crucible of the Battle of Britain, which raged from July 10th to October 31st, 1940, the ferry battle found itself thrust into the forefront of the conflict. Six ferry battle squadrons, including the newly formed Polish squadrons No. 300 and 301, constituted the reformed No. 1 Group Bomber Command. These squadrons played a pivotal role during the battle, showcasing the aircraft's operational debut on July 21st, 1940, when six aircraft, drawn from Numbers 103 and 150 Squadron, struck at oil storage tanks in Rotterdam, Netherlands. As the battle unfolded, the ferry battle engaged in a total of 289 sorties, with the final mission transpiring on October 15th, 1940, as Bologna and Calais in France felt the brunt of the assault. Astonishingly, only six aircraft succumbed to the ravages of war during this period. Following this chapter, the battle squadrons underwent a transformation, being re-equipped with the Vickers Wellington, a shift that marked the end of the ferry battle's role as a bomber by UK-based squadrons, though it persisted as a bomber overseas until mid-1941. While the battle had distinct variants powered by different versions of the Rolls-Royce Merlin, including the Mark II, Mark III, and Mark V, these were essentially the same aircraft distinguished by their engines. Post-September 1940, the battle withdrew from active duty, finding new purpose in training exercises both in Britain and Canada. Additionally, it assumed roles as a target tug, designated the Battle TT, and as a trainer, with variations such as the Battle T and Battle IT. The battle also left its mark beyond British shores, with 16 light bomber versions serving in the Belgian Air Service. Duncan Menzies, a ferry test pilot, had showcased the aircraft to the Belgian Air Ministry in June 1937, leading to their acquisition and subsequent deployment during the German invasion in May 1940. By the culmination of its production on September 2, 1940, a total of 2,200 ferry battles had been constructed. Ferry, the primary manufacturer, contributed 1,155 units. The Austin Car Company, as part of the Shadow Factory scheme, produced 1,029, and one lone specimen emerged from Hayes, fulfilling orders placed by the end of 1939. Yet, despite its prolific production, the ferry battle faced the harsh realities of war. Much like the German Stücke, it could only thrive in regions blessed with local air superiority, a luxury it seldom enjoyed. Outmatched by the formidable Messerschmitt Bf 109, the battle, though not alone in its struggles, found itself ill-suited for the perilous missions it was called upon to undertake, resulting in grievous losses that marked its legacy in aviation history.